So when it comes to website development strategy, there are three main, I would say, sectors or parts that I like to think about when it comes to building a website. Because website development is just a smaller part of a bigger game plan, which is marketing, to just be clear, you know, clear. A lot of times we can get too much into the weeds to see the forest. And what I really wanted to show is more of a forest view, kind of forest dump it in a way, and just run for it and go for it to just give everybody, you know, a bigger picture of things. So if those, those of you all see some of this and you're like, hey, you know, I have deeper questions about it. Like I said, we can answer some of those later on. But for this presentation, I really want to stick to a lot of the upper level topics when it comes to website development and strategy. So the first one we're going to start off with is business. And within business or within your business, no matter what kind of business that you do have, it, it, you know, it could be a service-based business, it could be a plumbing business, it could be a bakery, it could be a nonprofit, it could be a hair salon, it could be you know, a medical practice. We're, there's always going to be something that we have in common when it comes to our businesses, when it comes to our aspirations. One of the biggest things that we want to start off with is our and this always ties into your business because if your website is not meeting your goal, whether it's WordPress or anything else, it really doesn't matter what that website's supposed to be doing because your goal is supposed to be the, the achievement that you are creating for yourself and for others. You know, what goals are they supposed to be reaching? Audience is the same thing. So who is your website supposed to be talking to? Who is your website for? Where? Who is your website? What is, what is the reasons why they would even come to your website? And then the third part, when it comes to your business, is going to be your competitors. So the reason why I have that on here is because a lot of times people forget you don't really need to reinvent the wheel. I think people undermine their competitors a lot in the, in the industry or in their industry. I hear often, especially because I come from a, a marketing background and having talking to clients i hear a lot of times we don't have competitors or we have the newest things and i have to slowly show them you know we all have competitors and it's not a bad thing to have competitors it's great to have competitors because the last thing you want to do is go into a, a niche or an industry or something where you have to educate completely everybody there to teach them what it is you're even offering what it is you're even doing that could be exhausting you know and there's a lot of time and money that comes into that so looking at competitors eliminates the whole reinventing the wheel, as they say, in my opinion. And it also kind of gives you a leg up on having to think of all the ideas that you would have to come up with in order to you know, create your product, service, or website. So these are the main three core components, I would say, underneath business when it comes to strategy, looking at the bigger picture that we all need to have, no matter who you are. Your goals, you need to know who your audience is, and who your competitors are. That way you're not worried about reinventing the wheel. Are there any questions on this part real quick? Anyone? That makes sense. Same thing in the chat. If you have any questions, feel free to, to, to put them in. All right, let me go to the next part. So let's start off with goals. <clears throat> so when it comes to goals and tying that to your website strategy, from a very simplistic standpoint, I believe that goals should be transactional. So if you're going to think about goals, I'm a fan of threes. When it comes to a website and I'm building out a website strategy for someone, I ask them, what are your three top goals for the website? I say, hey, make it something transactional. Make it something that has to do with money, monetary. An example would be we want to make $300,000 by the end of quarter three in 2023. That's something transactional. It's going to take X amount of sales to get to that point. So that's why, I, or we, we want to get a profit of a profit margin of 20% by the fourth quarter of 2025. That's another goal you can have. We want to make $300 per customer, you know, from our subscription business. That's again, transactional, something that you can measure. Right now you might only be making 100. So what are those things you need to do to get to 300 per customer? Maybe offer more products with the bundle. 
So that's why I say transactional is important because you do want to tie it to something that has to do with money in some sort of way. Or if it's not money, it could just be something numeric, you know, some type of number. Non-transactional. I think this is where a lot of us really get tied to when it comes to creating our goals. We think of something more based on our mission. And okay, for example, Marquise, what would be something that you would say that would be more mission-based for one of the goals that you have for your business, for your nonprofit? That's no, it's not so money-oriented. And I know if you father engagement. father engagement. So Marquise here, he has a nonprofit where he's helping fathers, and one of his goals is father engagement. That is a non-transactional goal, right? That he wants to be able to accomplish. And we've talked about it ourselves on ways that we can measure that, that's not dealing with money, but we can do surveys, you know, we can do other things where we can measure a goal of his. And again, it's not money-based, it's not transactional-based, but it is something that's important because we can use the website at the end of the day to have forms and surveys and collect this information, just, you know, to see, ask fathers, you know, how is their engagement, you know, with their child and X, Y, Z, you know, different markers. So that is something that would be a non-transactional goal. And it kind of, it goes to my next point here, which is measurable. Sorry, if I, sorry, let me go back real quick. It goes to my next point here, which is measurable. So we can measure every single aspect of a goal, right, through different analytical tools through tools that we can use like in Google Analytics, for example, and I'm going to actually show you all and everybody here how to set up or what Google Analytics looks like at the end of the presentation. Because I think that's very important because it's really easy to do and Google just had an update and it made it easier. So that's why I just want to go over goals and why that's important for a website strategy. And just is just simple. I know most people heard of the term smart goals, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time bound. You know, we've heard those terms before. But without getting too nerdy about it, I just think a good goal, just have one that's transactional, one that's non-transactional, and maybe another one that's either one of the other, you know, either or or in between, but make sure that they're all measurable because your website, if they're not helping you meet your goals, the website is pointless. I mean, I hate to say it like that. I hate to be very extreme, but a website is pointless if it doesn't help you meet your goals. It is what it is. It's an overglorified brochure. It's a vanity tool at that point. I just want to have a website, to have a website, to have a website, just have a website. What it's supposed to do? I don't know. It's the website. Goals are important. The next one is audience. Again, we're in the business sector. So we just talked about goals, what we want for ourselves. You know, there's, I forgot what the saying is, but it had something to do with, you know, kind of thinking about yourself, you know, people care about themselves more than they care about you. They start caring about you, you know, when you show you care about and when it comes to your audience, that's very true. You have to really understand and drill down who it is that's actually coming to your website. You can have all the goals in the world, but if you're not helping other people meet their goals, then you're really doing yourself a disservice because, you know, one of your goals should be about helping others, getting others to where they need to be. And these are different aspects or criteria, I would say, that you just want to think about when it comes to your audience. The actual people coming to your website, because if you're the only person going to your website, it's a problem there. You know, if your team is the only people going to your website, there's a problem there. You know, you want people coming to your website. So the question is, who are they? You know, where do they live? That's when we're talking about demographics. You know, what are they driving? What what is their marital status? What is their education? You know, these are things that you want to know. What, what type of interest do you have or do they have? Does your audience have? And this is more tied to if your business is more of what they call B2C, business to customer. If you are a B2B, a business to business, you're looking at firmographics like the age of the company, how many employees they have, what is their revenue share or market share. So those are just a few things that you want to look at when it comes to your audience. And then, as I mentioned before, their goals, their interests, their challenges, their motivations. You know, what do they actually want to do? What do they want to accomplish? What's keeping them from reaching their goal? Uh, Rhonda, for you, is Rhonda, right? What is, what is one of your biggest, I'm, and I'm talking to Rhonda here in person, but I want you all to please put in the chat, what is your biggest challenge 
in keeping you from reaching your goal. So Rhonda, what is your biggest challenge right now keeping you from reaching your goal? We have several Facebook groups and the file systems in Facebook are getting worse and we don't want to lose all of our files so we want to start that and then expand it in some paid things that can really happen too as well let me repeat that just in case so facebook is the key here you have a lot of facebook files that you're looking to reorganize or get reorganized yes because facebook keeps making it harder to access okay. and put things in the files. So Rhonda has issues with Facebook, AKA Meta. I mean, don't we all? That could be a whole conversation, y'all, yeah. right there, to be honest. She's had some, she's had some issues with, with, with Facebook, with some file, some file issues, and she really needs that. Make a database that's accessible. She needs to make a database that's accessible. So that's one of her challenges right now. And what, what would you say one of your goals, if you met that challenge, if you overcame it, what would that goal be that you accomplished? Well, to have a stable place that we can put our files and then to expand on that would probably be some other things that we're not able to do through Facebook, like some paid classes and things like that. Paid classes, paid advertising, okay, okay. So as, Ron, as Rhonda was stating, again, going back to Meta, AKA Facebook, y'all, again, if she could overcome her challenges, right, she would be able to meet her goals and she's motivated to do so because she wants to meet her goal and get more organized in order to start utilizing Facebook in other ways, which right now she's kind of having, she's kind of stuck on. So that ties into the journey and the path. Right now, for instance, you know, Rhonda's journey and path could be she started off with Googling something, you know, how to do this or how to do that, you know, through Google. Then she could end up going to clicking on a link and going to either a course or a blog page or something like that, where you're looking at. Now you're on the website. The next thing could be where Rhonda then goes and gives her email in exchange for, you know, the top 10 ways to organize or to help yourself do X, Y, Z on Facebook. And she, Rhonda gives her email. How are we doing? And Rhonda gives her email in exchange for this PDF or this guide. So the reason why I'm saying it this way from Rhonda's perspective, and I'm just kind of doing this on the fly, so forgive me if, if it doesn't sound the most polished, y'all. But the reason why I'm saying this is because I wanted everybody to be able to see that this is a journey in the path that everyone is going to take when they go to a website. And I don't mean everyone takes that exact journey or path, but everyone is going to ch take a journey or path when they're looking to overcome their challenges, reach their goals, and they're motivated to do so because they're interested in what you have to offer. This is something that people, once again, tend to overlook when it comes to building out their website. And then they get to the whole plugins and the whole tools and the technology, but they forget that all those things don't even matter if you're not actually helping people reach their goals and understanding the path and the journey that they're going through. Does that make sense so far? So that's pretty much like meeting people where they at. And meeting people where they at, mm -hmm. that bridge. You know, sometimes, sometimes you're building the bridge, sometimes you're allowing them to give you the information. It's almost like they're building the bridge for you. Now, you all, we always have to do the home, you know what I'm saying, most of the legwork, because when we're serving our customers, our clients, our people, they're not going to want to do your work for you. But when we listen to them, it's like they're building their own bridge. You know, the FAQ, like, you know, we ask them questions like, what do you want help with? They gave you the answer, like that's the most, you know, saying like they gave you, they're building the bridge and you're just kind of putting it for them. But that is the journey, that is the path right there. And I kid you not, every website, once you, and Marquise, I talked to you about the other day, once you put these new goggles on, you know, it's the eagle eye. I used the metaphor where I used to skateboard when I was growing up and I used to do a whole bunch of tricks. You know, I was a big fan of Tony Hawk and all those, and all those cats. And I remember that once I started learning how to skateboard and do tricks on, we call it street, on chairs and tables and things like that, I never saw the world the same again. Like every time I would go downstairs, I would look at rails, I would look at things that I could grind on and I could do things. A person would just look at it as something in their way. I would look at it as something like I can do a trick on that. And that's, I'm saying that to say that once you start seeing the journey and the path when it comes to some of these techniques and tactics here, and you look at websites, you'll be like, 
oh man, they got me in this funnel. They got me in this journey. I see the journey. And then you'll start to just mimic that on your own websites, on your own, uh, you know, marketing plans. So I'm hoping that that makes a little bit of sense why the journey and the path, it's very important because you can build that on your website through your web pages. So let me move forward and get to that actually. So competitors, <clears throat> again, we're in the business section right here, part one. And the last part is competitors. We talked about goals, you know, what goals do you have? What are your targets and your objectives? We discussed your audience, what are you, who is your audience and what are their goals, right? And what is their journey to be able to reach their goals? And now we're gonna to touch on your competitors because this is important when you think about if you have an audience and you have a target market, most likely someone else has your target market and your audience as well too. So if you can understand who they are geographically, as an example, where, where are they in the world or where are they in the United States? If, I know we have people here internationally, so that's why I said the world first. You know, where are they in your country? And then look at the keywords. What keywords? What are those very important words that people would Google that are leading them to your competitors? Because again, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We shouldn't be reinventing the wheel. So if we know what our competitors keywords are leading to them, we can use those keywords and add those to our website, add those to our plan, our strategy. And then word of mouth. Word of mouth is very powerful. We're all talking. You know, we're, we're all telling each other what's the new latest cool thing. How is our experience when we use this, the new iPhone? You know, I loved it. I hated it. This, we're always talking. That's going to be one of the most powerful ways to find out what your competitors are doing is what people think about them verbally. Listen to that because they're going to be talking about you too at the same time. And I think that when we add these things together, when we think about where they're located, what keywords people are typing in, because that's the beauty of the internet. You don't have to actually go anywhere in order to experience something these days. One of the things I, I learned about geographics uh -huh. is um, the culture is different everywhere you go. Culture the is different. Words can be different. Yep. Like the words that's used in Cleveland may not be the same terminology that they use in Columbus. Right. So I can see where geographics play a major role in your competition because if you go to Columbus talking like you in Cleveland, right, right, then they're gonna be. It's going to be foreign. It's going to be foreign. That, yeah. So what Marquise is saying, because he brought up a really good point when it comes to geography and understanding language in different, in different parts of the world, let alone, excuse me, different parts of your city or different parts of the state, where if you're speaking, if you're not speaking the same language, sometimes it's the actual language or it's even the dialect, how you say something within the language. But if you're not understanding or speaking that language, there could be a disconnect, you know, with that, with that person, with that company, with the offering. And that can cause conflict, that can cause friction in the connection. So it's very important, once again, to study, you know, to understand geographically how people are thinking, how people are using words where I'm from the South. So I grew up saying y'all, when the north y'all say you you know what i'm saying you, you know say so it's a whole different i come from down south like that i used to talk it's the same thing but i had to turn it off and start talking a little bit more northern because i got made fun of when i when i grew up when i was brought up from texas so i had to even switch and learn so you made up a good point right there so thank you for that marquise i appreciate that so let's get into traffic again if you do have any questions just feel free to put them in the chat as well and if there's anything that you're not understanding just please let me know. Michael, feel free to interrupt anytime. We we do have a we have a question from Katja Janar about they have they work for a nonprofit and the uh -huh. goal is to bring in more people to their programs. They have in-person programs that they charge for, and then they have a, a live stream component on YouTube. And they're really concerned about how to how to bring in more people for the programs to then get more money. And then also, and maybe we'll talk about this later, how to track some of that and, and how they know what's being effective 
through analytics or other means on their site to know where are they getting a response from and getting getting participants from. So how to get more people and how to track that activity for the for from for, for the registration. Yeah, exactly. How how to how to get get more more money from the paid participants and how to understand what's effective on their website for bringing people from the website to these in-person events or to the online views. Okay, perfect. Hold hold how, how do you pronounce it? Was it the name? I'm sorry. I don't want to mess up the name. Uh, I, I can un unmute you if you if you'd like to Katjanar. So I was going to say we are actually I actually okay. am going to touch on that. So it is a good question. Do you hear me now? Yes. I do. Do. Okay, Katajina. Katajina. Uh -huh. Katajina. I know you're yeah. still. Thank you. Um, I'm going to I'm going to touch on that question. I'm going to on more of the later half of this meet up of this presentation and then give you some ideas and that way you can tell me if the ideas that I give yeah. actually match mm -hmm. some of the the problems that you're facing, if these are some of the solutions that you may want to think about. Perfect. Thank you. Because I, that's a good, really good question, but I want to give it to you from a technical standpoint, because I love that scenario. Yes, perfect. The it's only, pro the only, not problem, the only thing is that I might need to leave because, you know, I'm in New York City, I'll be traveling home at some point, I might just need to step away and leave. But maybe oh, you will be able to answer before I I time. go. I I would I believe I'm gonna not get, I'm gonna be getting to it pretty soon here once I get past this part because that's more of the technical part. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. But I am recording this too, so whatever I, I'm gonna answer your question regardless. Don't worry. Uh -huh. Great, great. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. So and I see the question right here, so that's good too. It's in the chat. So let's talk about traffic real quick. And then I'm going to actually, I'm not too far from getting into her, her question. We touched on business and I wanted to touch on traffic because this is also important when it comes to thinking about how you develop and build a website when you're thinking about it strategically. So the three main parts of traffic are going to be sitemap, keywords, and when I say email, I'm talking about email marketing, to be specific, right? When I'm not talking about the one-to-one -one Gmail, but I'm talking about when you send a newsletter blast to people, when you collect emails, which kind of, oh man, I hate not getting people's name right. Katatijana, did I say that right? If I did, I'm sorry. It's also going to be somewhat a part of oh, your, your question. So sitemap, keywords, and email. All right. So the first part is sitemap. We're thinking about building our website and we're thinking about it strategically. And some things are not going to, some of the, because of the, the projector, there are going to be some pictures that don't show. I think it's just because of the color of it. But sitemap from its most simplistic form is just you stating, documenting, it's better if you document, what are the pages going to be on your website? What are they? Because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the how much traffic you get if they ain't going nowhere. Can you go back to that last argument? Yeah, yeah. I just want to go back real quick to kind of make that point. Yeah, it doesn't matter how much traffic you're going to get if they ain't got nowhere to come to. So we want to think about what are the pages on our website actually going to be. And this is just a simplistic way. This is a, a diagram of it in a way. You can literally just take a regular piece of paper and a pencil or a pen. You don't have to get all technical about it. Use a program. And just literally write down, I'm going to have my home page, I'm going to have my about page, I'm going to have a contact page. Those were I would call the three bread and butter pages. Most of every website, except for those one page websites, have a home, about, and a contact, right? And then based on your industry, based on your niche, and I didn't catch your name, I'm sorry. I'm Audrey, I was online, right? Oh, you were online? Okay, yeah. Audrey? Wiggins, yes, Audrey. Audrey, what, and what business do you have? A marketing business. A marketing business? Graphic and web design and help, you know, okay, okay, nice. Well, we got to talk because I got one too. <laughs> so, okay, Audrey, so then for your situation, then you would, it would make sense for you to have a, a pricing page, would it maybe, or a services page? Yes, yeah, services. For your, for your site map. Mm -hmm. Okay. Marquise, what would make sense for you to have on, that's not on here for yours that you can think about? 
A service page? Okay, give me something that she didn't think about. Special to yours. Names on there? Oh, yeah, anything. Anything that, that's not already here or nothing that she said? Yeah, uh, information page? Nice, information page. So Marquis just said he would have an information page for his on here. Rhonda, you know I'm coming to you now. <laughs> <laughs> I would say resources they would find useful. A, a resources page. Rhonda says she would put a resources page. All right, y'all, come on. I want put put it in the chat. We have, a, we have an information page, we have a resources page, we have a services pricing page. What, what, on, what on here that you would have that would make sense for your industry that's not already on here in your site map? And the reason why we're doing this exercise, because again, our products, I see that, okay. Products page, testimonials page, nice. Because I want y'all to start seeing the patterns or listen to the patterns that there's things that we all gonna have but there's things that are just going to be specific to, to our niche. And it's very important to think about that because once you think about that top layer of pages, then you have pages that connect with pages. What pages start connecting with pages? And I don't want to get too deep into that now, but that's when you really start getting into more of what the SEO type of activities that Google likes. Google loves it when pages connect within your page. It's called interlinking, interconnecting, you know, how pages naturally connect with each other. But just starting off by itself, it's always great to just understand how your site map works. And this is a part of your strategy. You know, this is a part of being able to think from a, a higher tier, big picture level of your website before you even start building out the pages. Any questions on that? Okay. So next one is going to be keywords. And keywords are very important. We, we, we touched on them very briefly before. But keywords are, I think at this point in time, we've all heard the term keywords. Is that, can I say that? I know it's, you know, okay. In the chat, has anybody not heard of the term keyword before? Okay, I think everybody's heard uh, on the call. Okay, great. So we understand the term keywords. Now, I, I wanna keep it simple here because I think it's very important to understand that when we're talking about keywords from a simplistic standpoint, we want keywords, first of all, that are relatable. They're relative to our industry. So when I'm thinking about a website strategy, or I'm doing a website strategy a document for a client, I always ask them first and foremost, you know, what are the words that you use in your, in your company that we can just start off with as keywords? So it, it's based on their industry. It may be start off with their products or their services. It could then go into the tools that they use, the equipment that they use. It could go to the verbiage that, they're, that their people, their clients, their customers, they use, and just so forth and so on. So what are the words that are relatable to you? Next one is going to be competitive. So keywords that are competitive to your market, to your industry. Typically, these will be keywords that your competitors are also trying to rank for. Sometimes you want to go for keywords that aren't as competitive. Sometimes you want to go for keywords that are very highly competitive. Those are what we call the money keywords to an extent, right? If other people are trying to go after them, that must mean something. It's just the most smallest rule to say, if people want them, it must, they must have some type of value. I know that's not a hard edge rule, but I promise you it works a lot of times But I overthink it. If other people want it, well, okay, well, why do they want it? I ain't got it. Let me go over here and see what they want it. Oh, it's because it's that money keyword. People are typing this in and it's helping them bring more money. So these are things that I feel that are important and then local keywords are also very important if you have a local business keywords like near me keywords that are associated with the area code people type in something plumbing in cleveland plumbing in san jose you know i need a contractor in san antonio you know uh this the keyword area code zip code four four something 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 this thing those are local based keywords. A lot of times people are typing those in when they need something quick, fast, in a hurry. Those are money based keywords. So if you can get those keywords, you are really winning because people want things fast, quick, in a hurry. That means something is near them. So this is just a simple way of getting into keywords for ways for you to think about keywords without having to go too deep into, you know, the tools and how to use them in other ways and, and, and formats like that. Any questions on the keywords part that anybody has? Okay. 
So then the next part is going to be email marketing. And as I mentioned before, I'm talking about email segmentation, email lists, email tags, sending emails to people in general after you've collected them on your website. And this is something that I feel a lot of people really don't pay attention to or they don't give a lot of value to when they're building out their website. And the reason why it's in the traffic section is because what's the point of getting traffic if you can't hold them, if you can't obtain them, if you can't add them to your actual list, you know, if you can't send them messages later on, you've done all this work with these keywords and you've done all this work to get this traffic, but at the end of the day, you really don't have the opportunity to be able to talk to them later, to send them messaging later. Is anybody here doing any emailing right now? Any collecting any emails or email marketing on your behalf? Okay. What about yourself, Rhonda? And Marquise? It's not really. It's, I communicate via email. Okay. To do different sites as far as fatherhood programs across the country. Uh huh. So I can say, yeah. Okay. Okay. So we have a few people doing anybody here emailing in the in the chat constant contact I see somebody using constant contact here. Anybody using anything else. MailChimp. So these are email tools that people use the email market. This is something that it should never be thought about as an aftermath when it comes to building a website, this should be baked into the strategy of the website, because the forms that you use the the the. the offerings that you have, the tools that you use, you typically are always leading someone to some type of conversion, whether it's an email capture or a sale. And this is what you wanna do in order to get so. You wanna think about the list. So what kind of bucket can you separate people in? Is it a newsletter that they're getting? Is it a webinar that they've seen? Can, can you put them in a webinar list? Can you put them in a newsletter list? When it comes to tags, are you able to say that this is the webinar that they did watch that they watch this webinar versus that webinar that's how you want to tag them and then when it comes to dynamic list it's just a fancy way of saying as an example you wanted to send an email campaign or coupon to people who have not purchased in 90 days so x amount of people who haven't purchased in 90 days and bought less than a hundred dollars worth of of product in your store i want to send them a coupon you would do that by creating some type of dynamic list or segment. But this is what your email tools are supposed to allow you to do. The whole concept is understanding that you want to attach email marketing to your website, to your website strategy, that it's very, very important. You know, getting all that traffic, people are coming to your website, and then you have no, no way of re-communicating with them later. You're just leaving opportunities on the table. It may not be money for you, but it could just be opportunities. So the last part, and this is the part that I really want to touch on, but I didn't want to skip ahead and get to the technology stack because this is something I know that a lot of people really wanted to talk about. But before we got into it, I just wanted to, you know, really touch on the business aspect of things and then the traffic aspect of things. Because when you think about the business and the traffic, the rest of this, your functions, your technology and your analytics, it all really ties together. And it makes you feel like ah, you have a cohesive plan. You have a long-term website and not a short-term website. So we'll start off with functions and features. So we think about functions and features, and this is where I can use WordPress.org as a really good example. But when we think about functions, we talk about things that are typically activities on your website. So people, you want somebody to sign up for something, or you want them to watch something, read, you want them to listen, download, search. You may want to have somebody buy a product, an estimate, access something, and then some type of custom content. When we are speaking on functions, we're really talking about the activities that you want somebody to do on the website. So this is where that whole term user experience really comes into play when we speak on, on that. And a good way to showcase that, for example, is if I go to the wordpress.org, and let me know if, my, if you all can still see, see my screen here. 
Is it showing the? Can you all see WordPress.org? I'm just making sure that it's actually showing my, my whole desktop. Okay, cool. So on WordPress.org, we have a search bar here, right? So they obviously want us to search. That's a function right there. They built that in. That wasn't by accident. Something else, I knew it too. So something else would be, okay, get WordPress, right? So download. That's another function right there. They want us to be able to download. So let's see if there's anything else. This would be considered, there's a drop down menu right here to be able for navigation. I know that's not on there, but I could easily put on there navigate could be a function. And they've given us a clear navigation way to be able to do so. And if they have, they do have areas where you can sign up or watch. So WordPress.tv, that would be an area to be able to watch. But these are just examples, though. I think that they WordPress.org does a really good job. Another one would be Apple. So just giving you examples. When you think about the functions, like what they want to buy. So you know how we just said buy right there. Apple wants you to be able to buy something. So these are just ways that and I, the buttons aren't showing because of the projector. I know people online can probably see it, but it's kind of hard to see here. But these are just ways that, or learn more. So that's another one, you know, we want you to learn more. And then this would be to read. So this is, again, just ways that we think about the functions. And then when we talk about the features on our website, that's when we're talking about the tools. So functions are the activities, what we want people to do on the website. And then features are the tools. So this would come in play when it comes to the plugins, specifically talk about WordPress. So we have our form, we have video players, our blog, our PDF. Again, I said email marketing before too as well. Our audio player, a search bar. We just saw a search bar on wordpress.org payment processing system. So if we were to actually buy a, a iPhone from, from, from uh, the Apple store, we would go through a payment processing um, system and a calculator would be an example. So does anybody here have any examples for specifically for the website, even those for you virtually that you don't see here on the features that you would need specifically for your website? And everybody speaking once. Search bar database. Anybody online as well too? Feel free to any anything here on the slide that you feel is not there specifically for your website, a feature or a tool. And the reason why I wanted you to see why this is important, because oftentimes, you know, when, when you hear people a hundred times, hey, can you build me a website? Okay, well, what's going to go on the website? I don't know. What do people want to do on the website? I don't know. I'm telling you, it's like a broken. I've heard it so many times when people, until they actually start seeing it this way, they don't realize that you don't necessarily know what your customers or what people are going to be doing on your website unless you've actually thought about, you know, what you're going to actually have on your website. These are the things you're going to have on your website. And when you look at the functions, this is what you want them to do. So this is like the activities, what they're going to be doing, what you want them to do. But then it's like, how they're going to do that. That's through these tools right here, through these features. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, please don't say it does and try to try to make me. Okay. And again, everybody virtually too, if that doesn't make sense, feel free to just speak up. So I want to make sure that I do address the, because hopefully now we're getting more into uh, your question, ma'am, about, you know, your specific situation. But I wanted to talk about more of the technology aspect of it as well, too, before we got too deep into it. So speaking of technology, since we are talking about WordPress, and we did talk about the functions and the features, so some of the tools 
and the doings, you know, the activities, what people are going to be doing on our website, a big part of WordPress when it comes to, I would say, mitigating a lot of issues. A lot of people be having website issues with WordPress, whether it's technical issues, whether it's, you know, hacking issues, threats to your website or speed issues. I'm talking about issues galore. A lot of these issues can be mis mitigated if you have good hosting. Do not go cheap on your hosting. I'm not telling you what hosting you need to use or why you should use it, but a lot of the issues can be mitigated through proper hosting because a lot of the hosting takes care of a lot of those issues just out the box. Everything cannot be avoided 100%. So that's where plugins come into play or good practices come into play. But hosting, I would say, is a big part of mitigating a lot of those potential issues. So I won't go deep into all these different types of hosting. I will say that shared hosting is the most popular type of hosting. I think that most people probably here in this session are using, but we have shared hosting, we have virtual private servers, we have cloud hosting, and we have dedicated servers. And I put next to cloud hosting, Google and Amazon West because that they're the most popular cloud hosting types. But like I said, most people are using shared hosting, something like a GoDaddy, a SiteGround, a DreamHost, a HostGator, Namecheap. Most people are using shared hosting for the most part. But even it doesn't matter what kind of hosting type you choose, just make sure the company you choose is a, a well-known or a very good premium company. And then from there, you can build your website on. Are there any questions about hosting? Bluehost is a, is a good one too. Bluehost, okay. In motion, that's a good one too. That's a good one too. Anybody here, do you want to put your hosting in the chat? I would love to see anybody, you know, what you all are hosting with yourselves. I particularly host with Cloudways and SiteGround. I, have, I want to host with Kinsta. We have WP Engine. That's they're a good one as well too. Spin WP Digital Ocean. Yep, I got Digital Ocean on here. That's a popular one too. I, I tell people all the time. I mean, especially for speed. And and this, we're not going to get too much into speed in this one. But when it comes to speed, people don't understand how much hosting plays a huge part in that. You can do use all the the plugins and do all the optimization you want to. But if you have a slow host, you can only get so far. No, you can't get past the, the 80 marker, if that makes sense. You know what I'm saying? So if the host is an 80, host A is an 80 compared to host B, which is a 95, and you're starting at the 80, most likely once you start building on your website, you're going to go down to like a 60, and you'll never get past that 80 because your host started at an 80. Does that make sense? No, just performance wise. I'm just saying 80, like 80% to the maximum, you know. Does that, does that make sense to everybody? As far as the host matters, because again, if you're at a 80%, starting off with an 80%, the moment you start building out your website, your site's naturally gonna get slower. There's nothing you can do about that. It's just gonna get slower. And you'll never get past that 80% because your host started at an 80% instead of starting at an 85 or a 90 or 95. So hosts matter, you know, a lot when it comes to speed and security. Those are the biggest two things I would say hosts will give you is speed and security when it comes to building out your website. And the third one I would say would be support because you know I don't think anybody in here is an expert on building hosts and hosting. So you always wanna have some type of really good support when it comes to your website. And Motion, we have another one too. So theme, theme is really, really important when it comes to your website strategy with WordPress because your theme is going to give you the ability to do a lot of things when it comes to your styling and eliminate you having to learn code or do a whole bunch of code. If you have a really good theme, it should have some type of feature or a button or an area where you can easily do what you want to do without having to do a whole bunch of code. That's the most simplistic way I can say it. And themes give you your styling. They, give you, they help you with the styling. These are the way that I would say you would want to choose a theme. And I'm going to show you real quick in WordPress what that looks like. But I first want to show you some of the criteria. Speed, you want your theme to be fast, flexible, you want to have a whole bunch of features, you want it to be integrated with as many other apps or tools as possible too. Usable, meaning like how you can use it, how easy is it to use. 
Is it compatible with other tools or, or compatible with WordPress? The latest update with WordPress. Believe it or not, your website, you'll have a you'll be using the theme on your website, and out of nowhere, your whole website just breaks because WordPress did an update and your theme wasn't compatible with it. So, and you just out, you know, you on vacation, you are at home sleeping, you're taking a trip somewhere, you know, you are, you know, picking up the kids or whatever, and then you get that phone call out of nowhere from an employee, from a customer, from somebody, hey, your website's broke, and you have no idea, it's because of the theme. You didn't have a theme that was compatible in your WordPress, it happens. It happens to people, it's happened to me, it's happened to my clients, it happens to us all. So that's why I'm saying it's important for you to think about your theme as making, making sure that it is compatible. It's a theme that is compatible and it goes to support updates. Typically, if you have good support with your theme and it's updating frequently, it's gonna be compatible. So these three kind of really play together in a lot of ways. But these are just some of the things that I feel are important when you think about your theme. So let me go show you real quick when it comes to picking themes. So there's two ways that you can do, do so. And for those of you all who are used to WordPress, who don't know what WordPress, this is nothing new to you, but I just wanted to show you real quick. Let me go to the theme real quick. I thought I clicked it, a little slow. Now let's go to WordPress, this is another area, so we can go to themes right here. So on wordpress.org itself, you can just go here, go to themes, and you'll be able to see the themes here that they, they've put kind of in a list, of, a popular order list, or you can go to the latest. I won't get into too deep on the different type of things like block themes versus full site editor things because this is not a session for that. But I just wanted you to know that you can go here to pick your theme. And if this would just be able to load, you know, so you can go here to pick your theme too. Let's see if I can get to it from here. And if not, that's okay. But it's not okay. So when you when you pick your theme, for instance, you want to look at the way that I pick, look at themes is I look at ratings. So I do like a little Amazon theme, you know, for good or for bad. But we all know the Amazon theme. We look at the ratings. I look at the ratings. I look at what people are talking about. How many stars does it have? The reasons why people you know wouldn't use it. And I also look at the description. And this just lets me know. And I look at when's the last time it was updated. You know, was this was this theme updated re fre frequently? I mean, uh, recently, is it updated frequently? How many installations does it have? How many people are using it? You know, I'm not saying be bougie about how you're choosing something, but I'm just saying, you know, do a little bit of, you know, due diligence, like, cause this, it does give you a, a indication on what's good and what's okay and what's bad and what, what, what you may like. So that's not good, that's not good. Come on, do that to me. It typically only happens when you're trying to do something, make a point. Yeah. Um, so that's why I'm saying the theme is also very, very important. And this is the biggest ways that, like I said, I choose a theme. But you choose whatever theme that you feel comfortable for you. You can start with the WordPress theme. This is the uh, makes us a, a specific theme every year. This one is their 2022 edition. But you can always start off with their theme, and then you can move to another a new theme that you would like later on. Let's see, do I get some love here? No, I don't. Okay, all right. So let me move forward here and go to the plugins. All right, so plugins. This is something that I think most people, for good or for bad, it's like a kid in a candy store when it comes with plugins. And what I mean by it's like a kid in a candy store is most people will go into WordPress and just start adding a whole bunch of plugins to their website because they can just add free plugins to their website. So we act like real big kids because, oh, I can add this new shiny thing and this thing and that thing, and I'm just gonna add this thing and that thing. And, you know, just like, you can just, you just, you feel like, you know, you're living out your childhood youth where mama said you couldn't, you can't get that, you can't get that. And you're like, I'm finally here. I can add whatever I want. And those are the biggest things that cause the biggest issues when it comes to websites. Because it's just so easy to add anything you want, do whatever you want, but you're not doing it with discretion. You're not doing it with a thought process in mind. You're not doing it understanding that some plugins don't work well with others. Some will cause, you know, conflict with others. Some will actually break your site just because they're just not updated frequently. And this is something that I wanted to show as well, too, because this is how I tend to 
organize how I think about plugins and technology. So I felt like it was easier to just show y'all than to just kind of just tell y'all. So what I like to do is I like to say, okay, this column right here is my plugins. This is a company. And I say whether or not I'm using the pro version or a free version. I talk about the details, so I keep it very simple. This is what this plugin does. This is what it's for. I want to know from a simplistic standpoint, this is what this is for. This is really not for me. When I document things, I do it for scale. I do it for other people. So I don't, people don't have to bother me to know what's going on. So I can go do what I need to do other ways. So this is what this is for, for other people. This has probably been one of my biggest lead generating tools or I would say engagement pieces when I post on social media into like certain groups where I show people this and everybody always wants me to make a template of it and I tell them, no, you got to take a snapshot or a picture because this is internal, this is my stuff. But it gives people the idea of, oh, this is how you organize your tech stack in a way where you can pass it to a team member or an employee, or you can look at it years from, from now. I've had this for over a couple of years, and all I do is update it over time. And my new staff members that come in, they read off of this and they know exactly what we have and why we have it. And they ask me no questions. This is, the, this is the sheet. This is our technology. So this is why I have something like this, and it, and it really does help be able to see. So that's why I'm saying the purpose. Like when I say purpose, it's really more of like the details, like what is it there for? And then standard, the way that I document standard is it's standard of market position. Is it, is it an alternative? Like is it a, a plugin or a technology that's alternative of the industry standard? Is it alternative of the gold standard? When I say gold standard, I'm talking about it's the top of the creme de la creme de la creme of tools. This is the gold standard of tools. Industry standard is this is one of the most popular. Alternative is, they just came out and they're kind of, you know, trying to be the new standard, but they ain't there yet. But they, we, I got it for the, for the low, low, you know what I'm saying? Or I got it, they do what they need. I'm just being real with y'all. That's how I categorize, you know, my tools, my technology stack. But does this make sense? Anybody have any questions on kind of what this looks like? And I know it may not, you know, look at, it may look foreign to y'all to some degree, but this is just how I organize it. No questions on, on the, okay. All right, all right. Sorry about that. Okay, so. Quick question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, your plug oh, all this on your list. Maybe I'll, I'll just wait because you said down here pay, pay and you know, I was gonna ask you, you buy all your plugins. I yeah, these these ones I do. Mm -hmm. I I kind I really wanted to. So I wanted to, I wanted to show y'all. I had these two sites up because I had one site I pre-built that had my free plugins, mm -hmm. and another site I pre-built that had my paid plugins. And I wanted to show y'all just the difference real quick. So that, so that the answer to your, your question perfectly, actually, ironically. That's why I'm kind of sad that my, these just kind of like timed out on me uh, a little bit because I already had these pre-built for y'all. And now all of a sudden, that's not, that's no bueno. Oh, man. But yeah, I did have them. I had two different sites for everyone, for everyone to be able to see. That way you can see, you know, the actual, that's what this snapshot is from. It's actually from one of the websites I had built to show you. If you only wanted to use free plugins, mm -hmm. this was my recommendation to build like a really good lean WordPress website. I'm recommending these free plugins. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to build a more pro-based website with these, it's the same plugins, but the pro version. Mm -hmm. And that's what I really want to show y'all like right now live. So y'all can be like, okay, well, if I want to build a website from scratch, he's telling me this is the exact tool to use. And this is the creme de la creme de tool and it's free. So kind of going back to the kid in the candy store, it's okay to have the candy this time, but it's good candy though, it's premium candy. I'm just to be honest, it's good candy, but it's free candy though. You can add that to your stuff, so you're access later. Yeah, 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 I, I actually, I will. I'll show everybody that later. So I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to say, I'm sorry to say that y'all can't, can't see the thing. But the next one is gonna be integrations and automation. So. I feel like this is important to talk about because when we talk about plugins, typically, in my opinion, it's better to use a plugin on WordPress for your integrations, for your automations. Now, I'm not saying you have to, I'm not saying anybody has to, but I'm saying it's, it's a lot better because they'll typically they will integrate with other WordPress plugins easier if you use a plugin that does your automation that's on WordPress versus using a third-party app, basically a non-WordPress-based tool 
to do your automation with Zapier. So these are the integration automation apps that I recommend because these are the most popular. And there's one on here that's the newest one that is gonna be coming out soon here. Sorry about that. It's gonna be coming out soon here, but I just wanted you all to see that if you're thinking about connecting your WordPress website with other tools outside of WordPress, or say you wanted to do your email marketing and you wanted to collect email from your form, how are you going to move that email over to your email tool? A connector app like this, an automation app would do that. It would help you move that. Say somebody purchased a product off of your website and you wanted to send somebody a coupon or send somebody something special afterward, you would use a connector app to send them a message after they purchase a product. Hey, thank you for the, da, da, da. here's a coupon for the next thing. These apps give you the ability to send information. Say you wanted to post to Facebook, you write a new blog post and you want that post to automatically go to Facebook. A connector app like this would do that. It would help automate that process. So that's what these apps are for, is to help you make connections with other apps, other tools whether they're on WordPress or they're outside of WordPress. Zapier is one of the most popular ones. This one is not a plugin itself. And it's the most popular one. It's, they all have free, free tiers to them, but these are the ones that I would recommend. Sure Triggers is not out yet, it's in beta, but it will be coming out soon. And you'll be able to get this also from the WordPress repository. So Uncanny and, and Automator, these are also both found in the WordPress directory or the repository for free you can just add these to your to your website for free when you're you know just looking for a new plugin look for automator or uncanny and that again they'll give you the ability to connect other apps with each other i just think that's important so that way you don't feel that your data is siloed it's just on wordpress you feel like you can take your information and your data and you can do things outside of wordpress because in wordpress is just a part of your whole marketing strategy your overall marketing strategy and then the last part when it comes to your tech stack. And this was also a part of connecting the dots of your goals, as we talked about at the beginning. So kind of like a Kevin Hart comedy a skit, you know, he always brings back the joke from the beginning of the thing to the end, and he brings back that, that, that joke part to it. We talked about goals in the beginning. So I wanna connect it, you know, again, connect the beginning to the end. When we talk about goals in the beginning, if you know what goals you have at the beginning and you, done all the other web development activities that you need to do and you've launched your website then what this is the then what part the analytics you know this is measuring what's happening on your website that way you can make the changes that you would like to make yeah, the best about the other day, right? this is exactly what i'll talk about the other day so literally the best way to kind of show uh, is to show y'all this is google analytics 4. And I feel like anybody who is creating a, a website needs to have this connected to their website. I'm sorry for, for, for those of you know, for y'all that are here, because it's kind of hard to see some of the report, excuse me, but Google Analytics 4 in its most simplistic form, it is not necessarily an update from the previous version of Google Analytics. It's a whole new analytics tool. They rebuilt it from the ground up. So for those of y'all who are, are watching this, understand that Google Analytics 4 is not a new version, I mean, it's not a upgrade or an update from Google Analytics. It's basically a whole new version. And it was done to simplify for the average person to be able to hook it up to their website and kind of see very easily who is doing what, where, how, and when, if you were just to only see it as a snapshot. So if you only want to see, if you want to see the users, how much money you made, I'm showing you my personal data right now. It's not a lot, but uh, I didn't want to show you anybody else's. Be able to see where they're coming from, uh, you know, ge ge geography-wise, see where they're coming from, channel-wise. You know, if you just needed to see this real quick, what I love about this is it's just giving you quick snapshots. You know, how often are they doing these activities for? What pages are they going to? You know, you don't even have to drill into things. What, what conversions? What are the conversions? What are the events? And when I say conversions and events, what I love about Google Analytics 4 is it easily gives you a way. It tracks a whole bunch of conversions outside, out the box and events out the box. What I mean by that, events are activities happening on your website. Conversions are the most important activities. And before, you'd have to do a whole bunch of setup through other tools in order to really create 
what is now very easy to be able to see. So events, again, are things that are activities happening on your website. And if you're like, okay, well, this activity is very important to me, such as a purchase or a checkout process or watching a video, maybe an order confirmation, all you do is click this little toggle on and it turns into a conversion. And this is Google's way of, call, of using the term conversion in exchange for goal. It's the same thing, goal conversions. So if you know your goals at the beginning and you know your, 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 your different targets, you know what you're looking for, you can even call something sub goals. So you have your major goal, you have your sub goals, right? Your objectives, you know what to call conversions. And then you can just measure these conversions in Google Analytics very easily. And then you can see on your reports, you know, are you meeting your goals? Are you meeting your conversions or not? If you're not, well, what do you need to do in order to meet those conversions? So that way you can make the changes. And in my opinion, this is what recreates a really, really optimized website where you have the ability to be able to build it from strategy and be able to update it later on based on actual information, based on actual reports, actual data, and not what you think is happening. But again, I wish I could show y'all because there was just so much. Oh, it's working now. Hallelujah. <laughs> Okay. All right. It's working now. All right. All right. So this is, this is where I get to show y'all the plugins part. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to bring it back. I'm going to bring it back. That one, this one works. Okay. So this is the free, this is what I was suggesting and you can use alternatives. Remember I said you can use alternatives. So, you know, don't shoot the sheriff now, uh, but I'll just give you some suggestions that if you want to use something that would be a, advanced you need something that has custom post types on the website so basically in wordpress these are all considered post types you want to make your own post types you need a plugin for that a very popular plugin for that is custom post types right here and then when you want to make certain fields like when you're creating different forms on your website and you want to have very very specific type of fields for your forms a very popular tool called acf advanced custom fields this is one to do so for forms, a lot of people use Contact Form 7. It's a popular one. I like to use Fluent Forms. There are many different security plugins out there, so many out there. One I recommend is iThemes Security. For building out your web page, this is called Cadence Block. So I'm going to show you that here in a second. But this is to help you build an actual landing page or your web pages. Then Presto Player is for video, Rank Math is for SEO. This is for if you want to see Google Analytics on your website. So if you don't want to, and this is well, I love WordPress as well too. Some people don't enjoy looking at their analytics here from analytics, from Google Analytics themselves. So you can literally look at your analytics from WordPress right within here in your site kit. It just gives you a nice little a simplified view of looking at your Google Analytics right within WordPress. Shortcut, this is for taking payments, for creating products and taking payments. It's an alternative to WooCommerce, which is a very popular e-commerce plugin. These are the two automation integration plugins that I mentioned before. It's very important to have backup. So if you have good hosting, going back to your hosting, your hosting will have backup. It'll have what they call server-side backups. And that means your hosting is backing up your website on their servers, but you never wanna depend just on your hosting. A backup needs a backup. So you can use a plugin to back up your website as well too. So if you backed up twice now, let the hosting back up your website, also back up your website through a plugin and then push that backup. You can back up to your Google, if you ever heard of a Dropbox or Google uh, uh, Drive, you can back your website up to Google Drive or Dropbox. These are things that you can't do with other platforms like Wix or Squarespace. So that is an advantage of using WordPress is that no matter what happens to your website, you can always take it with you, if that makes sense. You can, with the plugin, it will push your backup to Dropbox automatically. Yep. Or to Google Drive automatically. Yep. So again, double. So, and that's the best security you're going to have is having that backup because something will always be able to go wrong. There is never a hundred percent guarantee, but when you got two points of backups, for the backup, 
One a popular one is Updraft Plus. That's a very popular one. WP Vivid is another popular one too. I like that one as well. Is it, it, anybody have any questions on the thing? Just making sure we're still good. Okay. There aren't any questions, but if I could ask you to repeat in-person questions for the video so that we can hear. Sometimes we can't hear the. the oh, oh, sorry about that. It was it was more of a well, it was kind of a question, but. but what, Rhonda was it? She was asking me basically just another suggestion for for backup. Was the backup I was suggesting up there was that a good one? Updraft Plus, and I was just giving her another one, which was WP Vivid for another backup. Yeah, well. Thank you. Thank you. So these are the main ones I would say. Like this right here, I would tell you right now, this isn't my secret sauce. As simple as this is, I'm telling y'all right now, this is a secret sauce right here. Everybody that's watching this, watching this in the future, there'll be secret sauce type stuff. Like as simple as it, I may be simplifying it, but this is secret sauce. I'm telling you, telling you. Don't bring your mask down. Like I tell you, so, I'm going to tell you something right now. But it's that secret sauce because <laughs> this really is the meat and potatoes of what most websites need. Most websites are going to need to take form. So going, I forgot, I don't want to mess her name, but, but she was saying, talking about being able to take those payments, right? Short card. Short, I'm telling you, telling you, telling you, Shortcut is about to be a WooCommerce killer. Like it's going to be a, one of those plugins that takes so much market share of one of the biggest ones, WooCommerce, because it's allowing people to take payments on their website very fast, very easily without slowing down your website. Because once you put WooCommerce on your website, you get into a whole new world territory of bloat, of speed issues. Shortcut is getting into, and this is not a, a presentation to really go too deep into it, but Shortcard is a plugin that's technically not even on your website. It's called headless, meaning that even though you see it on your website, all the activity is happening on your website. It's actually happening on their, their servers. Mm -hmm. So you're doing the payment processing on your website. It looks like it on the front end, but all that activity is really happening on, some, on a whole new server. That's new. This is, this is what, what is that, what do they call it? Disruptive. This is a disruptive game plan. Like this is new. So this again is going to allow you to take payments and not only take payments, but you're able to, it does uh, tax, does tax on the fly. So when I would use WooCommerce, I would have at least 10 different plugins with WooCommerce. This plugin helped me replace five to 10 different plugins by itself. It's a game changer. Do you know how many people are going to lose their jobs because they, they don't need to be optimizing people? I, I don't need you to help me with WooCommerce no more. I got short. I'm just, I'm just being, I mean, I'm being extreme, but I'm telling you, that's, that's the game changer this type of thing does. And it allows you to do physical products. Well, it's getting to the physical, but it allows you to do services and it allows you to do uh, digital products as well, too. But I'm not going to say too hard. I'm not going to harp on it, but I just wanted to share that. This is one of those innovative type of one plugin like, like Lord of the Rings, one plugin to rule them all. Like it's like the one plugin that gets rid of, you know, a whole bunch of plugins. Superhero. Right, right. I'm, I'm big on that. I'm, I'm real big on that. Another game changer is using a plugin that is based on code snippets. So WP code is one. I'm going I'm to go over to hopefully this is working now. Okay, so I'm gonna go over to my premium version. So I gave you all the free version. All these are free. Sorry, all these are free. So when I say free, free for free, free, free. I'm talking about you can go here to the WordPress repository and search for all these plugins and I'm saying telling you this is how you build a lean machine automation machine ATM machine sales marketing machine WordPress website, these are the type of plugins, you can use an alternative or whatever you want to, but these are the types that you want. You got marketing you got sales you got automation you got video. You got page building. And I'll go into page building here in a second, let that load. Now here's the same version of that, but almost the premium side. Mm -hmm. So all I did was add the pro versions, basically of the free versions of the other ones. So instead so of Fluent Forms, we have Fluent Forms Pro. When I say the pro version, it just gives you more um, features. It unlocks more features for the most part. Mm -hmm. But that's another key thing too that I wanna share. Most plugins that have a pro version, they're more incentivized to keep updating the free version. And why that's important because you want your free version plugins to continue to be updated over time, whether they're free or not. Because when you have a plugin that's not updated, it, 
it's more susceptible for hacking for people trying to use that as a way to get into your website and you know what I'm saying bug your website up so people plugins that have are incentivized that they get money they can hire employees they can update them it's just one of those things that people don't talk about often but that's the way that i know if a plugin is going to be a long-term plugin if it's going to be good because they do have some way to make some money which incentivize them to keep updating even their free tools instead of pump and dump situation but these are the pro versions so same thing i would say the only difference that i did was i i used metabox instead of I went backwards. I use MetaBox instead of Advanced Custom Fields. Presto Player, I'm gonna show you something real quick too, because I did say that this is a great way to understand that when you use premium plugins or really good plugins, it makes your page building experience even better. So what I mean by that is, for example, this is these are blocks right here. So if I was gonna build a website out, for, for example, I wanted to use an image, and this is the drag and drop experience for people who aren't used to WordPress, who don't know about Gutenberg, this is WordPress's native page building experience. This is how you build out pages is with Gutenberg. They're gonna call it, they're gonna change the name and just call it the editor, WordPress editor. But what's important about this is most people didn't know that until this happened, WordPress, people didn't think that you can do a drag and drop where I can just literally drag and drop content, you know, and start writing things out. I can just drag and drop content. With the text, I can just drag and drop content, just like that. It, it wasn't that smooth before. And this is where WordPress had a game changer when it came out with this ability to be able to do so. So this is Gutenberg. And if you have really good plugins, you'll notice that you see shortcut right here. There's shortcut. This is that this is that plugin I said that was the WooCommerce alternative, right? Mm -hmm. So you have what they call blocks. So if a plugin does a really good job for creating like content blocks, you'll be able to see them here on the left side and you can just drag and drop. If I wanted to add a little checkout form here, I can select one I've already made or I can create a new form. I know this is gonna be terrible, but you can see here, I can start off now. You can't see this here on the screen, but this, if I want to start off with a form right here and right now, I'm gonna say create. And I would associate a product to this. And now I have a checkout form. I'll put a product to this checkout form, and this would be a form. So Shortcut actually has blocks that you can make on the fly. I love that. The same thing with Presto Player. So this is a video player. Let's see, where is it at right here? I can actually just, this is the best way to show y'all search. So Presto. So I just typed in Presto, and now I can add a, let's say Presto YouTube here and say I wanted to add a YouTube video, I would add a YouTube video right here and it would, it would give me the ability to have a YouTube video and I would have advanced features over here when it comes to my video. And that all came from this plugin Presto Player right here. So that's why I'm saying if you are certain plugins, if they're really good at what they do, they will, they will create a block for you over here where you can easily, instead of using code to add it to your page, they just have a block over here you can just use this block in your page building experience. Same thing with Fluid Forms. Fluid Forms right here, you see this is, the, this is how I would create forms. So if I wanted to find a block for Fluid Forms, they should have one as well too. So I say I just made a form and I wanted to put it on the page. There we go. Put the form here and it says, choose your form. Okay, bam, now I got a subscription form. So let's preview this. It's gonna look terrible, but I just wanna give you an example. That would, that's what the video would be. And then here's like the subscription form right here. If I put the name in here, this is that form. So I was able to just use a block over here to just make my page building experience just a little easier. And then I can get rid of all this, just to show y'all real quick, for those of y'all who are new to Gutenberg, I highlighted all these kind of like layers almost. Now I'm black to a blank slate. And then if, because I'm using a, a block plugin called Cadence Blocks and other block plugins do this. So the blocks give you the ability to have these content pieces here, we'll say, but certain blocks give you this library feature where you can click the library button here and then you can use different templates. So you don't have to start from scratch. Let's say you're a cleaning service and you want to borrow their about page. Now you have a template that you can use. And now you can go in there and change things out to your will. 
Is that similar then to elemental or astral? It's astral? very similar. Okay. Very similar. Absolutely. Elementor is what they consider a page builder mm -hmm. plugin. Right now we're using the page builder experience of WordPress natively, okay. but we're using a plugin mm -hmm. that gives us kind of more advanced blocks while using WordPress's page building experience because WordPress has blocks themselves. You don't even need a plugin. You can build out pages with their own, but their some of their blocks are a little, in my opinion, limited. So I'd rather use a, a, a block plugin to give me more advanced features. That's the only difference. But that was a good, that was, so it, the question was asked, was it similar to Elementor and Astra? And so that's why I was saying Elementor is a page builder plugin. Astra is a theme as well too, but uh, this is just a very way, and, and Elementor, they call them elements. And in WordPress editor, they call them blocks. Same thing, you know, same thing. But yeah, that's the, basically what I just wanted to show y'all that, you know, all the way from the strategy to building out the page building experience, this is where you start adding those forms. So we, we knew, remember, we knew what, what different elements we wanted on the website, right? Because we, had, we, we decided that this was the features and the functions. These are the things that can help create the features and the functions. Does that connect the dots? But see, people don't think about that. They don't ask, well, what are my features? They just go into the, I just want to start building pages out. And this is what I need to do. But yeah, that's, that basically is what I wanted to show y'all today. Anybody have any questions here or virtually as well too? I'm going to repeat your question too after you oh, ask okay. it to. The page and versus the free plugin is if you're building a site for somebody else, do you, are you buying the plugins or are you using their code cards? Their, you know, their cards? So the question was for paid and for free, if I'm buying them from somebody else, am I buying the plugins with my own credit card or am I basically offering the, the cost to, to them? I mean, that is a good question. It really does depend on the situation. If, if they are, so this is why I'm a fan of, here's another piece of my secret sauce right here. So I typically, if I can, I like to buy my plugins if I'm, if I'm in the know-how, right, if I'm being a real nerd and I'm in the groups and my ears are to the streets, I can catch plugins at the deal stage where they're new and I can get a lifetime deal. Some plugins still have lifetime deals forever. Some only have it at the beginning of their life cycle, like when they're first made, when they're, because they're looking to inject cash into their company so that they can boost creation. So they'll offer you, you pay one time, you get forever. To me, that's the, those are the, you know, that can get addictive to a degree. And I always tell people like, don't count on that because that'll get you in trouble. But I'm dead serious. I went through years of buying lifetime deals. That's why, that's why I understood how to vet plugins. I wasted a lot of money buying things that turned to be duds. But if you can get something that turns out to be good. So if I do that, if I get a lifetime deal and I have unlimited licensing, then I, then that's typically where I'll put that license on the client. Okay. Okay, so the follow up with that is because a client of mine, their previous webmaster passed away. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, so when she's scrambling, trying to find out what, you know, what he thought. And so when he passed, of course, all these licenses passed with him. So what happened to the client site? That's what I want. That's a good, so that's where, yeah, that game. Mm -hmm. But the, the, not, that's the thing about WordPress and about plugins is that the licensing can always be, it doesn't break the site. That's one advantage I will say about WordPress. So, so to that to that point, if you put a license on somebody, say you put a plugin on somebody's site with a license on it, and you no longer have contact with that person, I mean that person, yeah, it's gonna hurt. Like I don't have the license, okay, but your site your site doesn't break. You can replace that license easily. The website doesn't change. You're just replacing the license out. That should that's an advantage right there. You know, and that's only through WordPress. Yeah, other because other other tools aren't typically using a licensing system mm -hmm. well, for the like active. Yeah. So that's why you said WordPress is the best thing, or the one you prefer. It, it has a lot of advantages, but don't 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 get me wrong though. It has some tough spots too. Mm -hmm. It has a learning curve to it, but that's the advantage of it because yeah, like I don't use all these plugins on one site. I use certain ones for certain sites, right? And there's times where if I put a plugin on a client's site, somebody's site, and I say, hey, you can have this for a year, you know, 
after that year, I might deactivate if they stop paying for it, right? Now, their website doesn't stop working. They'll stop getting updates for that plugin until they replace that license. So they can't get, like, their site don't break because of me. You can replace the light. Does that make sense? Like, it's up yeah. to you. Like, yeah. so that's, that's the, now, if it's an unlimited scenario where I have unlimited, for me personally, this is my moral, this is my moral compass, y'all. I'm just giving y'all my thing. I typically tend to either do deals or let people know, like, hey, I don't, I'm not incentivized to delete. I have unlimited licenses of that. So say you and I do a deal and I'm like, hey, a part of that deal was you get to use my plug-in licenses. I'm not going to take the plug-in license off your website because I'm not incentivized to. I have unlimited. I can put as many as I want on. Now, if I was limited, I only had 25 or 100, I got to be a little bit more mitigating of that, right? I mean, that's just the natural game of the game. So that's how I go about it personally. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah. Any, any more questions? Because that was, that was a good question. And what most plugins continue to operate. Yeah, and, and to Michael's point, most plugins do continue to operate. They just don't provide the updates. But that's the thing, like you do want the updates. Like you, you want your plugins because that's one of the easiest ways for your website to break. One plugin can break your whole website. That's the crappy part about WordPress. Excuse my lingo. But that's the, the, the sucky part is like, you know, one plugin can really break your whole website. So do you, so do you guys that's a good question you now that we have wordpress where we are now what i mean by now is this wasn't this way for years this only happened within the last year or two but we have automatic update capability so you can turn it off or on like i'm doing right now it's up to you that was a good question see that's where that happened to a computers a lot too it happens to computers a lot a lot of people lost their jobs because of this this update <laughs> Yeah, you know how many people are getting paid just to update people's websites? And then WordPress was like, we're going to end that. We're going to give it to you. We're going to give you the ability. And people were like, oh, man. Now you can't tell clients like, hey, you know, you, I mean, you can, but, you know, it was what it was. So, but yeah, that was a game changer. People needed it automatic because, I mean, when you, this is a little bit. What I, I'm telling you all right now, this is minimal. You see 18 active. Typical websites have up to 50 different plugins. For, it is a lot to maintain and manage. So just be careful with that. You know, don't well, be that's that. Why you need somebody on your team to do nothing but look at the computer. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> or or that. But anybody have any questions in the in the in the chat as well too? I mean, don't don't get me wrong. Y'all asking some real good questions, but I'm glad. I mean, whatever y'all asking, like I love that. I can, now that they're working, I could just show y'all instead of trying to like explain it to y'all because now hopefully it makes sense like, as far as the thing. But I just wanted to show y'all, you know, all the dots. I just wanted to connect. I know it, it it's it's tedious and you know it's not so you know cool or whatever to get through. But at the end of the day, I really do think it's important to understand that you know you got to think about your business. So now I want to show you all a big picture of the slides so you can see, like we talked about the business part, right? Our goals, our audience, our competitors. Then we got into the traffic, right? So it ain't no point of getting no traffic if we don't know about our business. And when we got into our traffic, we said, okay, well, we need to know what our pages are because it don't matter what type of keywords we want or who we want, who the audience, going back to the if we ain't got no pages, where are they coming to? Like, where are they landing at? How are they getting there? You're getting there through keywords, through Google or through social media. What happens when they do get there? We want to get their email. We, we, we want to be able to keep having conversations with them because if, if we did all this work to have people come to our website and we ain't being able to retain them, retain, keep them, you know, you can't. So we talked about that. Then we talked about the technology, the functions, the features, the tools, the activities that we want to happen on our website, right? We, and we just went through, okay, hosting is very important because that helps mitigate a lot of security issues, a lot of speed issues. So that way we don't have to have so many plugins later to compensate because we did a great job picking our hosting. We don't have to have so many plugins because we did a great job picking our theme. Sometimes people be using plugins for features that certain themes have. But they don't think about it that way. I'm not thinking from a strategic standpoint. So some themes will give you features that you don't even need a plugin from. And then we talked about plugins. Okay, if we're going to use plugins, make sure it has a purpose. Purpose being what type of process do we want this, this technology to be able to do for us? It's just doing a process for us. What do we want it to do? That goes back to our functions and our features.
But does that make sense now, kind of seeing it from a big picture? But this is website strategy. So functions in your features is right, then your plugin is, 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 is minimal. They should, be, they, they should be minimal, they should be consolidated too. You should know that. If you thought about it, if not, you're going to be guessing when you get to the plugins part. I think I need this. I think I need that. I, I, I might need this. No, you don't. You just would have wrote it down. So, but yeah, that's what I wanted to share with everybody. Michael, do we have any questions or anything else in the virtual side of things? No, there weren't too many questions that came up. Uh, David brought up the good point when you were talking about the WordPress blocks to touch on patterns and how the patterns are, are, are a connection of blocks, but how powerful that is in quickly Absolutely. building out pages. I do that real quick because that's that's easy. And I'm glad you brought that up because that is also something that's very important. So if I'm here and patterns are also another way of being able to remember how I showed you templates from this button right here. Patterns are the native WordPress based type templates. So I showed you templates using from a plugin patterns. WordPress calls their templates patterns. And these are the same thing. I'm going to scroll down here to the bottom. And then I'm going to click a pattern and we should see it. And it's just a starting point. It's just a starting point. I don't want to start from scratch, so I'm going to use a template. Now, now, now I, can, I can fill it in. It's a fill in. So to, to, it was David, yeah. If that's a good, this, so this is WordPress's native way of being able to give you the capability to say, I don't want to start from scratch. I don't have time. I'm too busy. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So when I was when I was um, telling you about the little thing I was doing with Canva, that's what that is. Do they it's it's about? it's very similar. You know, it's very similar. It's just right. the WordPress version of that. Right. It's the WordPress. It's, but it's that Canva template. Canva. We so Marquise was talking about. We were talking about Canva the other day. And it having the ability to have templates and have the job. This this is I love using parallels. This is parallel to that, just a different platform. Heck, people even will use Canva, build their graphics on there, and then put them on work, you know what I'm saying, on the thing. So now you're using two birds with one stone. Does that make sense? Like, but that, that's it. That's all this is. So, so, so that was a good, uh, David, that was a good one uh, to bring up the patterns. And I love using patterns. I love using templates. It's just really good starting points. You know, you don't have to build from scratch. If you want to, you can. But notice anywhere I click, I have the ability to change this. And here's the cool part. I can preview it in mobile and see what it will look like in mobile. I mean, WordPress didn't used to be this easy now. I'm trying to tell you. It was good and it was easy, but it's gotten easier. And a lot of people don't understand how easier it's gotten because they've never seen just a demonstration. This is just a short demonstration. This ain't the power of it. This is just a little tweet. This is a little taste of it, you know, a little, little sprinkle of that sauce, of that little salt and pepper. Yeah, I appreciate everybody. I don't, I don't want to make this longer than it has to be, but I did want to show you all again the bigger picture. That's why I said let me keep the slides short instead of trying to do 50 slides and stuff. You know, talk about it, get through it, then let y'all all connect the dots at the end of it, see a little bit of demonstration of it. And then anybody that had any questions, you know, feel free. It's I'm open book, but yeah, this is this is the this is what's it, the presentation. Hey Maestro. Yes. You know, to go back to Katsujanar's a question earlier, and maybe this could tie in a lot of the, the different points you spoke about across the slides. Mm -hmm. They were looking for this nonprofit they have where they're, they're trying to cultivate an audience and mm -hmm. move that audience through some of the funnels you were talking about from mm -hmm. an online information system to an in-person event. And could you maybe tie that together for her a little bit of all these different tools you talked about? I know it's a it's a big ask for a, for a short amount of time, but maybe maybe give an example of how a site like that, like how you might structure a site like that, so you could inform people online and give them some mechanism to engage with an in person event and then track that. Okay, well, let's do this then. Hopefully, and then you can guide me through it while I kind of give this example real quick. So let's pretend that. Uh, let me, so we're in person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's do this. There is an event template, if I'm not mistaken, here. 
And is it here? Okay, I'm gonna, use, I'm gonna use this conference right here. All right, so we have home. I'm gonna bring this in real quick. Hopefully it goes fast. And even if you don't, you know, have to necessarily build out the the actual site, but maybe maybe talked about what the process would look like and the types of tools that you've you referenced earlier. What those might, what choices she might want to make to help her along that path. So, if we're talking about registration to an in-person event, I would say you know you would one need a homepage, something like this, right? That would make that would make be a landing page. So you would need that landing page. Then it would be up to her to decide, you know, what her mechanism of registration is going to be. So going back to what I was mentioning before, when it came to the different blocks, one method of registration could be just doing a form, like fluent forms here, and I can drag this right, I should be able to drag this right here in this little block area, boom. And say, say she created the event form, right? I know this is a contact form, so I'll just give an example here. But say she created the event form here in the landing page. So bam, you know, they're signing up here through, through, the, through, the, through the email, put their name in here, here's the event. And then for the in-person part, because that, that's, that is pretty specific. So if I were her and it was gonna be in-person, I personally would use Eventbrite and I would put, I would add an Eventbrite widget. They might actually have it in here, but they might not. Let's see. Oh, did you? They might. This is an old blocks for Eventbrite, but they oh. I thought they had an Eventbrite block. So you can either use an Eventbrite block or you can use Event, Eventbrite and just embed. So it should, if it were here, it was going to be in this little area right here. Yeah. But yeah, you would use that, you know, build out the, build out the ticket process, you know, build out your tickets in Eventbrite and then add it here on the page. And then that way, registration can go through Eventbrite and she can use in the check-in process. When people go to the in-person event, she can check them in as they come through the Eventbrite app. That, in my opinion, would be one of the most efficient ways to do it if it's specifically for an in-person event. So that way you had a check-in process, so you know who actually came to the event. Everybody doesn't do that. Or you can do a registration process. So say it's a, you want to do registration on your website. Once again, you can, let me remove this. And you can create a, let's say, a, a checkout. Oops, check out right here, create a checkout form, create a new form. We'll say ticket reg registration. And now I'm creating a checkout form here on the fly where a person can register for their ticket. ticket. And I can say product here. I know you can't see this because this is terrible as far as what you call it, but I'm just gonna create it anyway. So say that this was the ticket process. So now a person would pay for the ticket here on the page, as I mentioned before. So there's many ways to go about it. It just depends on how she would want to do that registration process and that che check-in process at the actual physical event. Because now we have the ability to take, we should have the ability to take tickets. I don't know where the ticket form there. It was right there. We should have the ability to take tickets though. Cool. Does, that, does that answer the question, at least from a I, I think it does. I mean, it, it's, yeah, her, her question it has a very large scope, but I think especially with that technology stack you demonstrated earlier, there's a lot of tools in there to help her along that process. And, and she's offline now. She's going to be watching later. But okay. uh, yeah, I, I think that's, a, that's a, a good start, a good foundation. So thank you for that. Perfect. But yeah, that's anybody else have any questions? If, if not... We will wrap it up. I think that's it from the online side. All right, all right, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Well, thank you everybody for attending. I appreciate you all for attending here in person. This was, this is awesome. Thank you. Hopefully I didn't do, do too bad. And I will be, I don't have the slides here, but I will have them available 
I'll make sure that I, I'm going to send them all out, make sure everybody gets them as well, too. The slides, once I get them available, and then everybody here on virtually, I'll make sure everybody gets the slides as well, too. I'm going to send the uh, message through the meetup and through Slack as well. And then our next meetup, I'm going to be thinking of next month. When is that going to be? But most likely it's going to be here as well. So hopefully we'll have even more of a turnout because you know, the first one's always the, the rough one, the experiment one. But uh, yeah, I'm going to start getting more organizers to help out. I'm going to get more feedback about topics y'all want to talk about. So that way I can kind of cater towards that. I just want to start off with something very introductory. Right. Foundational. foundational. Before you get to that side. Yeah, before we get to all the nitty gritty, you, what you should look for. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's what this was about. Well, thank you all as well too. Stop recording.